Welcome, folks. I'm so, so grateful to be here with you. Um, this is Meditation Monday. My name is um, Edgar Fabian Frias. It is an honor to do this um, work for you and to offer this, and I'm so grateful to the Vincent Price Art Museum for helping create this space for our community. Um, this is um, part of their um, VPAM roll call, and they're offering different kind of ways to check in. Um, this last weekend, there was an amazing DJ set, and they're also inviting in um, some incredible artists to also speak on Wednesdays. Last week, it was Mario um, Ibarra Jr. And um, last Monday was so wonderful. We had such a great group of people that came and like really offered their like support. Uh, we did readings. Um, it was with myself and Asher Hartman, and we received so many wonderful messages from people. So um, we're definitely really grateful to all of you for joining us. Um, and I wanted just to name that in the upcoming weeks, we definitely have a couple more um, exciting special guests that are going to be joining us, that are going to be um, a, a part of Meditation Monday. And for today, what we're gonna actually be doing, it's a kind of like a three-part kind of um, live stream. There's gonna be, um, at the beginning, we're gonna be doing a little bit of a somatic meditation. I have um, a specialized training in this process. It's a mindfulness process known as Hakomi. And Hakomi is a somatic psychotherapy process. So um, I'm definitely gonna be bringing in some of that knowledge that I have and working with an awareness of our body noticing and also doing very gentle movements and of course you modulate this for um, however however makes sense for you um, and then after that i'm going to just do a little share about my own experience with meditation how i got into meditation and how it's like supported me and um after um we talk about that i'm going to move into talking a little bit about the neurobiology of mindfulness so um i have some books here that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit. This one here is called the, um, the Pocket Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology. And so we're going to talk about how our brain works and how meditation can help our brain. And it's going to be coming from this field. And I'll share a little bit more about that later on as we kind of um, go on in this video. So again, there's three parts to this. Um, we're going to start off, though, with a guided somatic meditation. Um, I want us to just have a moment to connect with our bodies here, to really kind of invite our bodies into this space. Um, I'm definitely seeing there's um, a lot of folks here saying hello. Hi, welcome, everyone. So grateful that you can all be here um, to be a part of Meditation Monday, which I've been really, really enjoying this. So. Um, we're gonna start, and to start, you know, feel free to either sit comfortably or if you're laying down, let yourself just get comfortable. And we're gonna be moving our awareness from this space where we're talking with each other, you're listening, and we're gonna move our awareness inside. So starting to kind of shift, noticing a shift as you move your awareness in. And just noticing where the awareness goes. Does it feel like it's in your head? Does it move down into the lungs or into the hands? Just noticing when you go within, what part of your body do you go into? Or do you feel like your awareness is a little bit more outside of your body? Just taking a moment to notice. And as you're adjusting, coming into yourself, see if you could take a few deep breaths here. Really bringing your attention, your full awareness to the breath, to the air. Really allowing those sensations of the air to 
take up all of your awareness as you notice where that air moves through your nose or your mouth, as it enters into your body, into the lungs, into the diaphragm, into the belly, and then back out. And see if you could, for a moment, take an internal temperature check. Just notice how warm, how cold, how hot is it inside. For myself, I notice that I'm at a pretty warm temperature, not too hot, but definitely not cold. Taking a moment to move your awareness to your shoulders. Maybe you can move them a little bit. Letting your awareness rest in the shoulders. Just seeing what it's like to gently move them if that feels right. Again, bringing your awareness to your breath. Letting your attention move towards your chest. Noticing how open or how closed your chest is feeling at this moment. Mine feels like it's starting to open. I can just kind of barely feel the energy around my chest starting to open. Maybe breathing a little bit into the chest, drawing some air. And as you're doing this, notice if any judgment comes up any doubt, any fear, any emotions that show up. And if you're able to, just let yourself welcome them. Bring some care, some compassion, maybe some curiosity towards whatever you notice as you Sit with your body. Now we're going to move our awareness to our hands. Maybe you can move your fingers a little bit. Or maybe put your hands together and notice if you can feel the inside of the hand, the outside of the hand. And if your hands are together, notice the sensations wherever your hands meet, those points of contact. Again, moving a little bit if it feels right. Letting your awareness take in all of the sensation of the touch, of the movement of the muscles. If it feels okay, maybe you can apply a little bit of pressure to your hand. Noticing the pressure. Just knowing that you are in full control of this experience. You get to watch what feels comfortable, 
what feels right. Now shifting our awareness, we move it down into the belly, maybe placing a hand at the belly. Becoming aware of any sensations any emotions, anything that you may be holding on to here in the space of the belly. If it feels right, maybe you could bring a little bit of air towards the belly. You could apply a little bit of pressure. Again, just being aware of the sensations, of how it feels to touch this part of your body. Sending some love, some care to our bellies for all that they do for us. Noticing what it's like to send care, to send love to the belly. Does it feel good? Is it a little uncomfortable, a little strange? Just notice, notice how that feels. And now sitting a little up, we notice our spine. You may notice that you might want to move a little bit as you feel the spine. It's totally okay if you don't want to, just notice. Notice if your spine feels soft and flexible, if it feels rigid or maybe somewhere in between. And if you're moving your spine around, just be aware of any sensations that show up around the spine. Maybe you notice sensations in other parts of the body. And if it feels okay here, we can Breathe a little bit of energy towards the spine. Maybe sitting up a little bit taller, holding your head up high. Maybe you put your hand on your back and you touch your spine. Taking a moment to send some gratitude to this part of your body that is connected to your entire nervous system that moves through the whole body. Taking a moment to send some gratitude to your nervous system Feeling it as pulses of energy or electricity around the body.
Taking a moment to send some love to your respiratory system. To your lungs, to your throat, your mouth, your nose, to all of the little passageways that bring oxygen into the body. Again, noticing the air. gratitude for this respiratory system. And again, taking a big breath here. Bringing our immune system forward immune system that keeps our entire body healthy, that protects us, that helps us regenerate. Notice if you feel your immune system in any part of your body, or if it feels like it surrounds you, or is all of the inside of you, just noticing. Taking a deep breath here and sending some love, some gratitude to our immune system for all that it does for us, for all the ways that it cares for us. bringing your awareness again one last time back to your breath. We're going to, at the count of three, take a deep breath together as a group here on the live stream. One, two, three. Taking one last moment here to just check in with your body. Notice how you feel doing a quick scan from the top of your head all the way down to your feet. Just noticing how the body feels in this moment. Gently allow yourself to return your awareness back into the room. Opening your eyes when you're ready. So thank you so much for kind of participating in that somatic meditation. I would love to hear from you what you noticed, what you noticed as you went within and you made some contact with different parts of your body, knowing that there are no right or wrong answers here. So whatever you notice is definitely what's right. And I'd like to share a little bit about my own journey with meditation, how I got to where I'm at now, and how it's helped me, and also maybe share a little bit of some of the challenges I've had. Um, you know, and so when I think back, I think I definitely started, you know, meditating at a very early age. Um, and I think the way I really did it the most was through prayer. It was a way that I really allowed myself to connect with my energy, my body, and also to the divine. And prayer is a really powerful way to be with yourself, to create some sacred space, some sacred time. I really like to see meditation as a sacred container that really holds what it needs to hold in the moment. So 
you know, after kind of learning prayer as I grew up, I was, you know, in my undergraduate program at that time. It was at UC Riverside. And I really started to have a lot of anxiety. I started to really notice a lot of racing thoughts. I was getting a lot of, you know, panic. I definitely had a couple of panic attacks while I was in school. And it got so intense that I ended up going for the first time to um, a counseling center at the university. And it was here that for the first time I really started to learn about meditation in the contemporary form that it's taken today. And really diving deep within for the first time was so powerful. It really allowed me to witness what was happening inside and to be with myself. And that's like a really big gift that meditation allows us to have is it gives us some time to be with ourselves, to connect, to listen, to really allow what's there, what's present to show up for us. And so as I noticed what was going on with myself, it really started to help me really understand some ways that, you know, I was maybe being mean to myself, not being supportive to myself, and then, you know, start to kind of explore what that was about, what, you know, what were those voices trying to help me or what were they trying to do for me? And also which of those voices were voices that I learned from the, you know, colonialist patriarchal system, right? Or from these systems that maybe are oppressive in that we live in. So really starting to kind of untangle and listen to what is going on inside, you know, who is speaking, what part of me is speaking. And so I definitely would say that I have both had moments in my life where I've had a, you know, a long meditation practice where I've been able to do it consistently. And I've also had moments where I have kind of done a deep dive into meditation and then maybe taken breaks. Um, and so I definitely say that it is something that you can kind of maybe move in cycles with and it can really make sense sometimes for you to really be with meditation and other times for you to maybe take a break. Um, and I'm seeing here, um, hi, the witch's muse. Yes, my little one really came out, the one if not being enough when I finally leaned and listened. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that, the witch's muse. I really appreciate that. It, you can definitely notice when you go within, you know, who's present. And sometimes we can be in a certain state of consciousness or have a certain part of us show up and kind of go about our days and not know that that part is really there and maybe wanting some contact, wanting to be connected to. So that's definitely a really big gift that we can give ourselves is notice who's present. And again, I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest blessings is that when we work with meditation, a big goal is to bring compassion, to bring love, a non-judgmental attitude, you know, bringing some curiosity about what's happening in the moment. And so, you know, in terms of like my own journey with meditation, I definitely feel like I have done all sorts of things. I've joined meditation groups. I've meditated with friends kind of individually. I've integrated meditation into many parts of my life. Um, as I said, sometimes I've definitely found it difficult to carve that space out for myself. And so I've noticed that I've started to bring in mindfulness or awareness into many different parts of my life. So from, let's say, from cooking food to um, maybe doing some self-care activity, um, noticing what that's like for me and really kind of becoming aware of that. And so really kind of almost bringing awareness into your life more and more and really working with and having an observant part of you, the part of you that can witness you, that can hold space for you, that can you know, bring some of that non-judgmental loving energy towards you. And we all have this part. And, you know, earlier I mentioned prayer. You know, one way that, you know, if you're definitely someone who is not spiritual or religious, um, one way of thinking of it is we all have a higher self or a part of us that is able to hold us, to kind of be with us, and to really kind of almost be with the entirety of us. Because we know as we go within, we are very complex. There are many different parts of us that show up. You know, there are parts that maybe feel really strong and really powerful, parts that maybe need a little bit more protection, parts that are hiding. 
there are all sorts of things going on and there's a part of you that can really hold on to everything and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go into talking about the neurobiology of mindfulness so you know as i kind of went deeper and deeper into my own meditation practices i also got very much into my own spiritual practices as well and i really see a really powerful connection between meditation and my spirituality it is a a building of awareness and of connection that's a big those are big things in both my spiritual practice and my meditation practice and you know i ended up going to school and i got a master's in clinical mental health counseling and I, as i said at the beginning of this live stream i was able to you know work in a somatic counseling center where I learned how to work with people with mindfulness and with experiential approaches where you work with your body, you move your body and you notice what happens and you're really bringing your body into the therapy process. And so that's a way that I really love to work myself, um, both with myself and also when I work with people as well is kind of integrating both what happens in the mind and also what's going on in the body, knowing that there's a deep connection between these two. And so, you know, while I was getting my master's in counseling, I um, ended up kind of getting a, a certificate in interpersonal neurobiology. And so the field of interpersonal neurobiology was started by this man here. His name is Daniel J. Siegel. He is in Los Angeles at UCLA, and he wanted to create a field of study that really integrated information from neuroimaging research, from neuroscience, and also from philosophy, from biology. There are many fields that have come into this field of interpersonal neurobiology. So Daniel Siegel is a person that started it, but there are, um, there are people all over the planet who are doing work within this field. And so one thing that's very different about this field than a lot of academic fields is that this field is systems oriented, it's holographic. It likes to look at connections and not just as parts because a lot of our system, the way we understand things is through parts or you know, separating things. And so this whole field is about making connections. And so the field of interpersonal neurobiology is looking at how the brain develops within relationship, knowing that the brain develops with other people, that we don't develop within a vacuum, we develop within connection. And so this really is a field that studies how that happens. So there are a couple of things I wanted to share from this field um, that I think are really important to understand. One of them is that, I'm gonna get my notes. <laughs> so they talk about mindfulness as being a tool of integrating our awareness. And so integrating awareness, they use this word a lot, integration, it means things coming together that are separate. Again, as I said, they're a systems-oriented approach. And when we look at the makeup of our brain, we actually have a divided brain or a brain that needs to come together. So I'll show you, like, they have this thing known as that Dan Siegel created. It's called the hand model of the brain. So I'll show you what that is. So with the hand model of the brain, you have your hand, the outside of the hand, this is the outer layer of the brain. This is the neocortex. It is the most kind of the, the newest part of the brain that has evolved um, over the last thousands of years for, especially here in humans, it's really highly evolved. And then as you go into the brain, what we have inside in the middle is known as the limbic system. So <clears throat> if this is the outer part that's the most highly developed, the inside the limbic system, this is the part of the brain that developed with all the mammals. So any mammals that are kind of relational, they all have this part of the brain known as the limbic system and it helps us stay connected. It helps us have emotional reactions. It works with our attachment. And inside here, you can see where my thumb is, this would be where in our brain, kind of if this is the outside, in our brain in here, we have something known as the amygdala. And so our amygdala is made to protect us. And it constantly is scanning the environment, trying to find anything that's new, anything that can be a threat. And so it's constantly looking. That's its job. 
And so, you know, the, the amygdala can be really connected lots of times to things like anxiety, to things like depression, to panic. Um, and so there are things that we can do with our outer cortex, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, that can really help the amygdala. And so underneath the amygdala, we go down into the earliest part of our brain, which is the reptilian part. And this is the part that evolved long, a long, long time ago, before the mammalian and before the outer cortex. And so this part of our brain is the part that keeps us alive, that really works with all those parts of our body, like our circulation, our heartbeat, our breathing, different parts of our body that are really not connected to like emotion or connection or the outer cortex. And so the outer cortex, what it does is, it is where language exists, it is where concepts exist, it is where we are able to make sense of things. And so if you could see with this brain, the outer cortex, especially this part right here, it's actually touching the limbic system and the reptilian brain. So it's connected to all three parts. And so right here is known as the prefrontal cortex. Our prefrontal cortex is a space of all integration in the brain, is where everything comes together. And this is where mindfulness is really powerful, is that with mindfulness, we're really activating our prefrontal cortex. We're looking within, we're noticing, and there's a very, a very well-known phrase in the field of interpersonal neurobiology that's known as you name it to tame it. And what that means is that as you're going within and you're noticing what's going on, you are start to name your experience and your process. And as you do that, you start to you know, be able to bring it in, kind of bring it up, let's say from the body, if you're having a, a somatic response, you bring it up from the body, up into the the part of your brain that's able to make sense of it, that's able to use words and language. And when you do that, then you're actually able to bring it into a narrative, bring it into a part of your life. And I think this is one of the really powerful things about mindfulness is that we're really able to be with whatever's inside, to be with those parts of us that really need attention. So again, they could be emotions, they could be sensations, they could be thoughts. And these are things that can really, as I said, allow us to really integrate, to make sense of what is happening within. So I know that's a lot of information, so I wanted just to check in to see if there are any questions or if anyone wanted to share anything about the different things I've just been talking about. Let me see. So, um, Vía matar, no sé qué significa eso, Melo Domínguez. Um, si me puede dejar saber lo que significa eso. Um, and so one of the things in the field of interpersonal neurobiology that they say about mindfulness is that we have different goals, different ways that we work with mindfulness. Um, so I see here, Beat Girl, do you have a guided meditation app? Um, I don't I don't really use one myself, but I definitely have heard people talk about meditation apps like Calm um, that have been really helpful. Um, I, I myself sometimes work with like YouTube uh, meditations or um, I also work with people who offer guided meditations as well. Um, but yeah, I definitely, do, I definitely know that apps are super helpful, especially if you need something that can be available at all times. Um, thank you so much for asking that question. So the, the goals of meditation that we have, and um, I definitely would love to hear if there are any thoughts about this. The, one, the first goal is to become more non-judgmental, um, become more non-reactive, so being able to be with whatever's happening, acting with awareness, so again, bringing more awareness, um, ability to describe our interior experience with words, and bringing more curiosity to the experience. Those are things that are really par a powerful part of mindfulness practices. Um, and so I see here, L.L. Durden, um, hi Lisa, 
Thank you so much for sharing this, Edgar. I miss your voice and I really needed this today. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I'm really glad that you could be here. Um, we used to meditate a long time ago together in um, Portland, Oregon. We were part of a meditation group. And it definitely feels good to connect with other people that you've held that space with. If you've never meditated in a group, I really recommend it. Sometimes you're able to go really deep into meditation when you're with other people who are also holding that intention. And I definitely hope that you can also feel that through this live stream space as well. Um, and so I also wanted to communicate um, one of the, something that I wrote down that I thought was really important um, with mindfulness <clears throat> that comes, again, this is from Daniel Siegel who wrote about um, mindfulness. He says, with mindfulness, we are training our brain and our capacity to monitor and to modify the flow of energy and information within our embodied brain. So our, our brain, not just in our head, but our brain as it moves through the whole body, through all of the nervous systems, because our brain is actually just connected to every part of the brain through the spine, through all those nervous systems. We actually have neurons within the heart within the stomach, within different parts of the body that communicate constantly with the brain and the head. And so when we work with mindfulness, we're actually able to start to work with the flow of energy that is in the body. You start to notice the flow, you start to kind of see, get a sense of what you're needing, what you're kind of maybe needing to help yourself feel better. And so you're constantly, again, watching yourself, you're taking care of yourself, bringing some more care to yourself. and. The second thing with meditation that Daniel Siegel says is we're also learning to offer ourselves kindness under stress, forgiveness with mistakes, tenderness with our vulnerability, and perspective when we are confused. And so we all need to have a part of us that can help us when we feel confused, when we feel lost, and, and this part can be ourselves. We can kind of sit with ourselves and notice, wow, I'm feeling really lost right now. I don't know how to make sense of this. And then, you know, instead of maybe like punishing yourself or getting mad at yourself, feeling frustrated that you're not able to make sense of something, really being with yourself can allow that moment to say, okay, yes, I feel lost. Yes, I'm lost. Oh, wow, that's, that's a scary feeling. Yeah. So really kind of being with that, being with it can be really helpful. It can help us transform the feeling. It could also help us kind of maybe even get some answers or some understanding about what could be some helpful next steps that we could take. Um, so I see here a couple more comments. Um, will you repeat that one more time? What I just read? Yeah, I'll read it again. I'll read the whole, the whole part. So with mindfulness, we are training our brain and our capacity to monitor and to modify the flow of energy and information within the brain and within our interpersonal relationships. We are also learning to offer ourselves kindness under stress, forgiveness with mistakes, tenderness with vulnerability, and perspective when confused. So these are things that we can offer ourselves on top of helping us understand and contain and be with what's happening within. We can also offer ourselves forgiveness, offer ourselves love, offer ourselves curiosity, compassion. And I'm going to be saving this video um, on the uh, Vincent Price um, Instagram. So if you want to see this later, and I'm also going to be putting this video up on my YouTube, just so that folks, if they want to see it later, so um, Gamzi, hi, it says here that the Pia matter is a part of the brain, the membrane surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. It's Latin for tender mother. Oh, wow, that's so beautiful. Yes, a tender mother. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish I knew what the Pia matter was. Maybe it's something I haven't learned about. Um, but is it kind of like the... Um, the part that kind of wraps around the, neur the neurons, because we definitely have a mycelial, uh, not mycelial, <laughs> um, I forget the name of it right now, but we have like a, a, a bubble around our neurons that protects it. It's made out of fat. 
And these are membranes that protect and they care for their neurons. And I love the idea of it being a mothering energy, a nurturing energy, a caring energy. Um, and that's definitely something that as we work with mindfulness, you know, one thing that, you know, this comment makes me think about is there are these wonderful lines in our brain from the prefrontal cortex, you know, from this part of the brain that go all the way down deep into the amygdala and they are known as our GABA lines. These lines help calm ourselves, help kind of quiet the amygdala and they actually strengthen and develop within mindfulness practices. And so the more you practice, and that's a big thing, a big key word with mindfulness is it is a practice. It is a tool, it is a, a muscle that you're developing over time, over time. And so that's like, again with that compassion piece, knowing like you're not gonna get it in one day, it's not gonna happen all at once, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take patience, and that's a big part of the process is being with what's happening. And I think, you know, one thing I've definitely heard from people is that it can sometimes be hard to meditate when you notice how much is happening inside. And I think a big invitation is just to be with what's there and to really, if you need to move that awareness to the breath or to a part of the body that maybe feels a little bit more quiet, try to be with that part. And again, allow what needs to happen to just keep happening while you continue to also set that intention to be with the breath, to be with a quiet part of your body. And so those are just some things that I've noticed for myself that have been helpful. Um, so I see here, <laughs> the witch's muse, they each feel like spells in themselves, sacred self-ritual practices. Yes, <laughs> I love that. Definitely bringing in some of that magic. Um, I definitely see meditation can, can be a spell or it could be a ritual or a ceremony. I actually was noticing using awareness myself that I love to make myself a drink before I start a live stream. And I was thinking of myself, like that's like a ritual that I do, something that is a container. So meditation is a container. It is something that holds our energy. Ritual is a container. Spells are a container. Prayer is a container. This vessel is a container. <laughs> Let me drink some water. And so we're working with containers. And as we know, containers take time to develop, take time to really become a part of us. And so really honoring the container of our meditation practice, knowing that it's gonna show up in many different ways. And so also keeping yourself interested and maybe trying to find ways that work for you with meditation, because there are many different ways to meditate. Um, and I see here, I think it protects the brain and the spinal cord. Yes, thank you for that, Gamzi. Yeah, I'm, I think we do have these sheaths around our spinal cord, around our neurons, and around our brain. We have a lot of layers of protection, and I think those are definitely um, very important in kind of protecting, because our nervous system and our brain are very, are very fragile. And so if you're interested in the field of interpersonal neurobiology, um, I definitely recommend this book. It's a little dense. It's called The Pocket Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology. It has a lot of information and some of it is very difficult to read because I said some of it is by neuroscientists <laughs> and neuroscientists have a very intense way of speaking that I'm not really that familiar with and it's taking me some time to understand it. But there's so much really magical information about the body, about the brain, about how we develop in relationship. And so Another book that's a little bit more on the like meditative side by Daniel Siegel is called Mindsight. This one is all about that part of our brain that's able to again be the witness that can hold us. And so this really gives some tools, some tips on how to develop that part of the brain, how to really be with ourselves, how to hold ourselves, not abandon ourselves. Um, and this is more of like a self-help, but it also definitely integrates a lot of neurobiology. So if you're interested in uh, this book, again, it's Mindsight by Daniel Siegel. And the last one I have that I wanted to show folks is if you have kids, if you are a kid yourself, <laughs> um, this is called The Whole Brain Child. And this is by both Daniel Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson, who's a PhD. And they wrote a book just really about how to work with kids using the brain as a guide. Um, 
And they have, I'll just show a little example here in this book, they have little scenarios and they talk about how to work with mindfulness yourself when you have kids. And they kind of share just different scenarios, different ideas of how to maybe communicate different things. And this is really about honoring the makeup of our brain, the makeup of brains of children. And I think, you know, for me, I feel this is really radical in some ways because I think we don't, we haven't really organized maybe some of our education or some of our ways of thinking around how brains develop. And I think having more of an understanding of how our brains develop within relationship can be really helpful to really know how we engage other people and how it's most helpful for us to learn because that's a big part of this book. It talks about what are ways to create the best environment to learn. So I'll show that again, the whole brain child. And then there's Mindsight and the Pocket Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology. So this is if like you're really hardcore, if you're wanting a little bit more of a self-help, kind of more of a understanding of the basics, an understanding of the neurobiology behind it, but more again focused towards self-help. And this is more if you want to have, if you have a kid, if you're a kid yourself, or if you're, you know, I think the witch's muse, you brought this up earlier. If you're learning how to talk to that inner child also, that could definitely be a big, um, a big way that you could work with this is how do you talk to yourself within, right? How, how are you speaking to that child part when it shows up? So I have a couple more comments here and I definitely want to just make a couple of minutes here for folks who have any questions or any comments, any struggles that you might have had with meditation practices that you want to share. Definitely feel free to share them with me um, or if you have any comments about this process. So I see here um, Moncho El Poet. Thank you so much for this. You're welcome. I'm so grateful that you could be here on the live stream. I'm really um, glad to be bringing this information. As I said, Therapy, mindfulness, meditation, rituals, all those things have been really powerful containers for me and have really helped me in my life, have helped me integrate more of my life and understand in more complex ways what is happening within me. So I'm really, really honored to be able to bring these um, tools and to share them with people. Um, the Witch's Muse says, I love seeing the visual drawings. Sometimes the academic writing can be so hard for me to get through. I appreciate the one for kids. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know, definitely. I really recommend this. It's super easy language and it has a lot of examples. I also agree, sometimes academic language can feel very cold, very indifferent, or very difficult too, very confusing. So I love it. And that's a wonderful thing about this field. There's another person that I recommend, recommend highly. Her name is Bonnie Badenoch, and the last name is B-A-D-E-N-O-C-H. And Bonnie, what she does is she writes about neurobiology through emotion, through shared kind of relational experience. She talks about it through, a lot of it through, about her own relationship with her clients, with her family, with herself. And so it's a really beautiful way of weaving in neurobiology with narrative, with stories, with showing how you can kind of really bring this understanding into relationship. So thank you for that, which is news. Um, Amy, Kate Bormet, thank you so much for sharing that emoji, heart eyes. <laughs> um, B Girl, thanks for sharing, you're welcome. I'm so glad that you all could be here. Um, again, this is Meditation Monday. I'm gonna be leaving this up here on the live stream and also I'm gonna be putting this up on my YouTube if you wanna see this later. Um, my name is Edgar Fabian Frias. Um, definitely feel free to go look on my um, Instagram, on my profile. I have links to my YouTube, and I also have links to my own website if you're interested to know a little bit more about myself. Again, I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm also a contemporary artist as well, and that's how I had the honor of working with the Vincent Price Art Museum. Um, and, you know, I wanted just to share again, as I said at the beginning of this, <clears throat> next next week, we are gonna have a very special guest that I'm really, really excited for people to connect with. We're gonna be doing again here on Instagram um, live stream. Uh, we're gonna have two people talking. Um, so I'm gonna be bringing this guest and we're gonna be having a wonderful conversation next week. 
And then in the following weeks, I also have a, another um, guest coming and a couple of things that we're really excited to share with everyone. So definitely feel free to come here on Mondays. I will be posting Monday mornings about what we will be doing. And then we I usually have some sort of live stream experience on Meditation Mondays in the evening, like today. So thank you everyone so much. Um, Duarte, um, I mo yes, thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate all your support um, and all your comments. And I definitely love that, you know, a lot of you message me outside of here. And I'm really, really grateful for all of your care, all of your support. And Gumzi, thank you. My back feels so much better after paying attention to it. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yes. Sending love to our backs. <laughs> our backs were holding us up. Yes. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that because I definitely feel like <clears throat> meditation can really be a, like a loving balm that you send to your body. So even, you know, even if that's a big part of your attention, just to send your body love and care to help it feel physically a little bit better, that can definitely be a really powerful intention with meditation. So, so Duarte, I'm now, thank you so much. Lisa, thank you. I'm really grateful for you all to be here. I look forward to seeing you all next week. And have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye.